Good evening. Welcome to Tuesday Evenings at the Modern. I'm Terry Thornton, Curator of Education. So glad that you could join us tonight. Um, I would like to take a moment to announce a new program that's coming this summer um, because I think you're my audience for this program. It's actually an extension of the Tuesday Evening Lecture Series. Um, it's Tuesday Evenings at the Modern Films. And um, as I said, it's an extension of uh, this long-running lecture program. And, and the hope is that we can find yet another way to contribute to a meaningful discourse related to the issues addressed by the art and programming of this museum. So that is our effort with uh, Tuesday evenings at the Modern Films. Um, as I said, it's a summer program beginning June 2nd with films by Robert Frank for our first uh, evening. Um, it's based, I, I was happy to get those films because um, Frank, while not represented in Framing Desire himself, is represented in his influence because he's influenced an awful lot of the artists in the exhibition. So I thought it would be a nice way to kick off the series. Um, and, um, so what I'm going to do, the way we're going to frame this, is we're going to have it um, relate probably in some way to the exhibition Framing Desire or other things in the permanent collection. Or, and this is an additional um, resource that I was able to find, I've asked each of the presenters for this season's Tuesday evenings to give me film and book recommendations, not knowing for sure what I would do with them. As it turns out, I'm going to be able to use some of those. So some of them won't be directly related to the exhibitions, but I think you'll find the links to uh, what we do here at the Modern. And um, I'm happy to report that I actually got um, a thumbs up from our speaker tonight, and we're going to be able to show some of her films um, for the, I know, I know, go ahead, clap. <laughs> there you go. That's exactly how I felt when I hit her up and she was like, sure, that'll be fine. I was like, oh, my job is done. Uh, nothing can go wrong tonight. Um, so anyway, this is very close to being completed. You will see things on the website and you'll also receive things through the mail or through email announcements. So be on the lookout for that. If you're curious and you haven't received any information, you know that you can contact me through the museum and I'll be happy to fill you in. Um, tonight is our last Tuesday evening lecture for the uh, 2015 spring season. Um, and while we are going out big, in all caps, with uh, none other than Laurie Simmons, one of the leading artists of the 1970s and 80s, New York-based uh, picture generation, we are also ending on what is sure to be a thoughtful and enduring note. Lori Simmons has had a long and active career generated by her intelligence, insatiable curiosity, and desire to see ideas manifested. The work relays her undeniable passion for what she does from her early stage, spare, and psychologically charged black and white photographs through the walking and lying objects of which this museum is happy to have acquired a walking house which I know all of you have seen in the Framing Desire exhibition, and various other series such as The Talking Objects, to her more recent colored theatric photographic series and films, films being short and feature length, incorporating puppets, dummies, and, li and living actors. Lori Simmons received a BFA from Tyler School of Art at Temple University in Philadelphia and then moved to New York where she works and lives today. Her first solo um, show was at Artist Space, which I think many of you know is a nonprofit gallery in New York that continues to play an innovative and significant role in the discourse of art. Shortly after, she showed at PS1, and in, 19, in the 1980s, she began showing with Metro Pictures. She had a mid career retrospective at the Baltimore Museum of Art in 1997. She has gone on to collaborate with architects and fashion designers and others, greatly expanding her practice. In 2009, as many of you know, she starred in her daughter Lena Dunham's feature-length film, Tiny Furniture. She has been recognized throughout her career with a long 
impressive bibliography and various awards, including an NEA grant and Guggenheim Fellowship, as well as the 12th Annual Aurora Award, which I have to mention because it is, this prestigious award honoring the best in photography is from um, Aurora Picture Show, which is in Houston. Lori is currently represented by a Salon, a Salon 94 Galleries. Um, throughout her career, she has developed a significant exhibition record with her most recent solo exhibitions, including last year's The Fabulous World of Lori Simmons at the Noyes uh, Museum in Nuremberg, Germany, and How We See that just opened in March and runs through June 9th at the Jewish Museum in New York. And I'm just gonna say that Carol Dunham, the painter, um, has the honor of calling Lori Simmons his wife, and as I said, Lena Dunham has the honor of calling her her mother. Tonight, we are fortunate to have her here to share her ideas and interests through a presentation of her work. So without further delay, please join me in welcoming Lori Simmons. Uh, thank you, Terry, for that. Um, wonderful uh, introduction, and it's such an honor and pleasure to be here at this phenomenal museum. I just, Michael Alping just gave me a little taste of the collection, but you're all so lucky to live in this town and have this museum as a resource. It's, it's really overwhelming. Um, I would prefer as many artists would, to talk about my most recent work, but I feel like I'd like to kind of zip a little bit through my history so maybe I could give some sense of how I got, how I got to now. Um, so I've just included, I mean, at this point, I, I started making photographs in 1976, so it's a, it's a pretty long history. There are so many images out in the world, and it's, it, it's actually overwhelming to try to create a lecture and figure out what to focus on and what to talk about. So if the beginning feels like a little bit of a kind of a speedy ride, that's the way I want it until we get to a more current point where, where I can um, be in a place where I'm more enthusiastic about what I'm doing now. Uh, so I'm starting took in 1976 because I feel like in some sense, I did not know what I was doing. I mean, in, in all senses, I did not know what I was doing. But it's so, it, it speaks to everything that I was going to do from this moment forward, which was to talk about scale in my work and to uh, start a discussion with myself about not only how photographs could tell the truth, but really about how they could lie. And one of the things that I would say about scale um, right off the bat is that the first photographs that I made, and this one was made in 1976, are tiny little prints that I made myself that are eight, around eight by 10 inches that I made in my own dark room. I hadn't studied photography in art school because frankly I didn't think photography was art. And it wasn't until I arrived in New York City in the early 70s and was hit with conceptual art, video art, fashion. There was so much going on in New York at that time and very little of it was about painting. Very little of it was about sculpture and very little of it was about printmaking, which I had studied in art school. So suddenly it felt to me like the camera was at the center of everything that was interesting to me. And that's when I decided to pick up a camera. So these were my first um, explorations into photography. And I was under the impression somehow that if I put a small piece of furniture in a room and photographed it and made this picture that maybe you would think it was a real room. It seems very naive right now, but I think that in my sort of new fervor for what I was doing and my interest in conceptual art, I really thought that I could be a trickster and convince people that these were real places. Well, obviously there's a <laughs> doll in this one, but um, for, the first, for the first few years that I worked, I did not want to put any figures in the photographs. I was embarrassed at the idea of including a doll because I felt like um, child's play was somehow taboo when it was connected to an adult, particularly a woman artist. How could I play with dolls? 
When I did finally put dolls in the picture, that was my challenge, to make work that was tough and serious and still had doll figures in it. And one, one thing that I'd like to, one very exciting thing that I'd like to share is that uh, the Whitney Museum opened its new space last night and the, they have in their collection a number of things of mine, but the last picture, this picture, which I call Mother Nursery, and this picture are hanging in the new installation, which is something I'm really like, excited about, very proud of. So in 1978, I just decided that everything I was seeing in black and white, I really was seeing in color, kind of like when Dorothy went from, uh, went from Kansas into Oz, you know, in one of the most amazing cinematic moments in film history. But I thought, I'm going to Oz now. And I just picked up a camera and some color film. I had no idea how to make color prints. I took my first pictures to the corner drugstore because I'd gone to Sonnabend Gallery, I think in 1976, uh, and I, I saw a Jan, a Jan Dibitz show, which was basically a rainbow with a number of small, made out of a, a number of small prints. And I asked the guy at the front desk of Sonnabend Gallery in New York how Jan Dibitz made it, the picture. And he said, I don't know, he sent his he sends his pictures to the corner drugstore and then picks them up and puts them on the wall. And this was an artist that I respected tremendously, a conceptual artist, and I thought, okay, I'm gonna do that too. So I started taking color pictures and sending the pictures to the corner drugstore and picked them up and looked at them and then I thought, I have to learn how to make color prints, which I did. So I'm completely self-taught in terms of knowing both photographic history and photographic practice although uh, the group of us working in the 70s at that time took great pride in our dirty, lousy prints. I don't know how else to say it, but we were kind of rebelling against um, the strict notion of photography and doing things like um, sending prints to the corner drugstore or having prints made at um, blueprint places that made blueprints. So. Once I was outside, um, I should say, when I was inside photographing women in kitchens and bathrooms in dollhouses, I was thinking a lot about my suburban childhood and the visual cues of that childhood. It was a suburban, post-World War II Jewish town that I grew up in, and it was very important. It was in Long Island, outside New York, and it was very important that everything look a certain way and have a certain kind of perfection. And I think my work has always been about those early memories where it almost, the surface of things was almost, I would say was more important than the inner life or the inner reality. So when I was outside shooting cowboys, I thought that that would be the equivalent of housewives in houses. This is something called color coordinated interiors. This brings me up to 1983. And I had this idea that women uh, should match the rooms that they inhabit. And these were um, tiny little dolls uh, called teenettes that were made in Japan by Japanese toy makers. And it was a Japanese toy, toy maker, a Japanese toy maker's idea of what an American girl looked like. So for several years, I would coordinate the dolls to both interiors and then um, famous monuments. Around this time, I started getting very interested in the idea of ventriloquism and um, also ventriloquism, which had seemed like magic when I was a child. The idea, I mean, it is so unsophisticated and flat-footed now, but when I went to a birthday party, as a little kid and there was a ventriloquist there and his voice came through a dummy. I thought that that was absolutely the most riveting and magical thing I'd ever seen. And then as an adult reflecting on that, I thought again about truth telling and, and um, who was really speaking. And it became a metaphor, again for me, for photography. Um, so there were years of my flying to a ventriloquist museum in Kentucky and shooting there. 
they had hundreds of dummies sitting in chairs, and I would bring my own, um, my own studio and set up backdrops, and I would pick dummies from the museum and put them in my little space and shoot them. And it was really just, it was kind of like going to a party and figuring out who you wanted to be friends with, because there were so many of them there. <laughs> And I remember seeing this guy, who, and they all had names, and they all had histories and owners, and I remember um, seeing this guy who's called Mickey the Frenchman and thinking, the, the look on this dummy's face is so poignant and, and so deep and so human. And that's always been my um, challenge, is to kind of you know, wrest human feeling and emotion out of inanimate um, creatures. Her name was simply Jane. So this, this uh, brings me to the series that's represented upstairs in the in, incredible, incredible photo show, beautiful photo show that I'm very proud to be in. Um, I think working with the dummies for so many years, I was, it felt very cerebral thinking about heads and brains and speaking and truth telling and lying. <laughs> And um, I had um, a kind of recovered memory one day. I remembered being very little and seeing these cigarette boxes dancing across the television set. And this, is, this would be a super long time ago. The TV was black and white. And it was an ad for Chesterfield cigarettes. And I remember being really enchanted by the idea of these objects dancing. And I, I felt like objects on legs were completely the opposite of the whole ventriloquism exploration. That if one was about brains, this was about brawn. This was about being, being able to heft this incredibly huge, huge object and walk around with it. This photograph is called uh, The Walking Camera, Jimmy the Camera. It's the first one in the series. And it was really an homage to the photographer uh, Jimmy DeSanta, who died in 1990, he died of AIDS. He knew he was dying when we made this picture. And he's also the person that taught me pretty much everything I know about uh, photography. He was a very close friend. So this was the series, um, the picture that, that started this series for me. And it's uh, really the only one where um, I used human legs. I think actually there was a purse on legs, but it became very complex to find objects to, that humans could wear around. And until I made a movie in 2006 where I actually had the Alvin Ailey dancers wear costumes and dance around, um, everything besides the Jimmy picture was on um, toy legs. And this again gave me an opportunity to think about the objects in my background, my suburban um, um, life that were given so much importance. And this is the one that's um, upstairs in the show. This is one that I actually shot in, these are from around 1980. 87 to 91, and this is one that I shot and I never released because I was really afraid of the interpretation of um, tomato used to refer to like a hot girl. And I was really afraid, you know, because I was, have always been considered a feminist artist and considered myself a feminist artist, I was afraid to release the photo. What I realized last year when I did finally make the photo and show it is that really nobody knows what a tomato is anymore. That <laughs> nobody was going to give me any flack except for you know, somebody of a certain age who probably would cut me a break. But it's, it doesn't, I'm so interested in the way that things, that meaning changes over time. And uh, I made a walking and lying gun uh, in 1991 and it was a very important picture to me, I'm sorry I didn't include it here, but I, I felt like it was about women and power and film noir and every woman having a gun in her purse and Raymond Chandler. And just recently I made an addition of guns to, um, as a fundraising project for New Yorkers Against Gun Violence. And of course 
our country has become more, both more sophisticated and polarized about these topics. And again, for me, I'm, I'm very fascinated by the way that the meaning of images changes over time, depending on you know, where we're at culturally as a country. I'm going to show a clip from the movie that will be shown this summer called The Music of Regret. And uh, it's, it was shot in 35 millimeter. It's, it's, it's got fantastically high resolution, but unfortunately the, the clip that I'm showing you is a little low res, but maybe this will be a teaser for, um, for seeing, coming back and seeing the film in the summer. One of the things that I've always pushed away, one of the interpretations of my work that I've always been uncomfortable with is the idea of humor. And I think by making a film, making a, um, a film that's a musical, I think that it allowed me to, to kind of open myself up to the idea of humor in my work and for this 45 minute film to let my work come to life and actually sing and dance and actually for one brief period of time to kind of embrace the humor in my work. Number two, please. So this was an audition of Next. all of the um, of all of the characters on legs coming out to. Next. Oops. <laughs> oh no. Okay. Um, all of the characters uh, we made costumes for them coming out to try to get a part in a musical, and I worked with the Alvin Ailey dancers, and um, they were really they were uh, incredible to work with, and I remember thinking like, well, what would a gun do? A gun would do a tango, and a house would do a tap. And um, the cake was on, the cake did a, you know, sort of a beautiful uh, ballet dance on point. 
and I had a really great time with it. And it turned out that uh, one of the one of the dancers was a expert tap dancer, the guy that uh, wore the house, and he'd been on Sesame Street. It was just the thing that he loved to do. So I got really lucky finding the guy to um, dance in the house costume. And also, just to make that reference to The Wizard of Oz again, when the house is um, swirling before it, you know, before it just kind of takes off in Kansas. So this um, moves again into uh, um, the ventriloquism period, and I made this sculpture called Clothes Make the Man. And they were meant to be, these guys sat in chairs on the wall. They were completely identical except for their suits of clothes. And they were hung at eye level. And that's a, that's a very um, iconic Beatles picture that I, where I replaced uh, the, the heads with, with dummies. <laughs> and I love the Beatles, I have to say that. But. Uh, so I have one more film clip that I want to show. There are moments in my work where I felt like I've moved to, and again, it's so, you know, as I talk about things, I think I wish I could show you this, and I wish I could show you that, but there are moments where I really move into kind of self-portraiture and making dolls in my own image. And this was when I made a ventriloquist dummy female. I couldn't figure out what to make her look like, so I made her look like me. And, um, a, one, the second act of the movie was about this figure, and I think that's what's coming next.
Okay. So I, that's, <laughs> I, I know that the question always is, how did you get Meryl Streep to do that? And um, the, that's a good question. And I knew, um, I knew Meryl, and I knew that she loved to sing. And the, uh, the man who did the voice for the dummy is Adam Gettle, who's the grandson of Richard Rogers of Rogers and Hammerstein. I knew that he'd had, a, he'd had a play at Lincoln Center, a musical, and I knew Meryl loved it. So this was before Mamma Mia, before she, really, you know, before she really got a chance to sing her heart out. So she really loved the idea. She sings three songs in the movie, and she really loved the idea of singing. And um, I had a really great time, because I do love the American songbook and American musicals. And I worked with the composer, and I got to write all the lyrics, including the Hawaiian part of that song, which took a lot of, like, I don't know, internet research to write in Hawaiian. <laughs> but it's something that I had a really great time with. And I think overall, I mean, I, I screened it. It premiered at MoMA. And for that scene, uh, there is a first act that's puppets, which is very, very sad. And when that scene came on and the Hawaiian scene came on, everyone started really laughing, just the way this audience did. And I was completely shocked. It had never occurred to me that it would be amusing. I had seen it all as, you know, puppet poignancy. And um, I think that it really, I think it really helped me to see that audiences took pleasure in it and laughed, and it really helped me think about humor, humor and art. And there is so much of art that we really love can actually make you laugh, you know, even sometimes the most serious um, serious of things can kind of catch you off guard. So it was a really, you know, a really important moment for me. That was 2006. And this is when I gave, um, back to still photography, and gave dummies their own thoughts, their own thought bubbles. <laughs> this was a series that I started um, right after 9-11, um, because I couldn't go to my studio. And I had a book that was a decorating book from the 1970s where you were supposed to put your own fabrics in the plastic pages. It was a ridiculous idea because look at the size of the herringbone. And it's just a crazy idea, but it was so beautiful visually. And I actually sat home with my daughters and cut things out. And we, we needed activities because we couldn't really go out and do stuff. So we started to make this series, which is the only time I ever really worked two-dimensionally and without light. And I feel like. One of the most important things to me, which started out that way and still is important for me, is the, the abstract notion of light and finding light. Uh, but this, of course, was a two-dimensional uh, picture that I re-photographed, and it's a series called The Instant Decorator. So I started putting the fabrics in and adding rugs and adding objects, and then I started putting people in and having them do all kinds of, you know, interesting things. <laughs> this is, um, I took what I learned from my two-dimensional work in the, uh, in the Instant Decorator and took the two-dimensional people into a, a very um, uh, kind of dingy, corroded dollhouse that somebody gave me. Um, and then I took the figures into um, sets that were, that I found uh, that were built by a, they're kind of sculptures that were made by a, a Latvian artist named Artis Winkler in the 1950s. And I, I bought these artworks by Artis Winkler. I have one catalog that I can't read because it's in Latvian. I know nothing about him, but I sort of love the idea that I found his art and then interrupted his art with my art. And the blue man who came from my very early work, I decided that he was the artist whose name was Ardis, A-R-D-I-S. This is a, a drawing that I made when I was 10. And it's actually, um, we, we've used it in the, in the book, the Love Doll book that I made. My sisters gave it to me as a birthday present after I did my Love Doll series. I didn't remember making it until they gave it to me. One of my sisters had kept it. Um, and I really love it because it looks like a, well, a Maiko is a, is a, is a kind of geisha and training a young geisha. And I really love it because it looks like a Maiko, except it has my face and my hair from when I was that age. And um, around this 
This was given to me when I started the Love Doll series, which, um, to briefly explain, I went to Japan in 2009. I'd never been there before. I found it tremendously inspiring, and I basically came back with a life-size doll that I could photograph. And this completely changed, um, a point where my work completely changed, because I no longer had to build sets. I could take this doll and move it in human scale around my own house or outside. And this doll arrived. It's, it's, it's called a love doll. It's technically a sex doll. But it's, it's beautifully sculpted, beautifully articulated. It arrives in a very kind of chaste nightgown with a little box with an engagement ring. And it's the only picture that I took that this was the first day that the love doll um, arrived. And what I decided to do was I thought, my first thought was, it's going to take me so long to get to know this doll. I'll probably have to take 100 pictures before I get something that I really like. And then I thought, no. I already know how to take a picture. I've been doing it for so long. Why don't I document each picture and decide that each picture, each day, is going to be, in a diaristic kind of way, the picture? So that's what I did, and I ended up with um, the Love Doll, days one through 33. And the days didn't happen consecutively. There could be weeks in between, or secretly, there could be failed days where I just decided not to call it a day. Um, but this is a number of the images from the Love Doll shoot. And the Love Doll arrived, I think, November, December. So this was the first outdoor shot. And it was interesting, when I had the exhibition, I made this work pretty quickly, and when I had the exhibition, um, I was in a, it was a different space for me because people came in and they just glanced at it and they looked at me and they said, are these real? So, you know, clearly they're not real, but at first glance, particularly the one before, you could, you know, you could confuse as a real woman. So now, you know, I, I found myself in a place where I was shooting dolls and people were questioning whether you know, they were dolls or real people. And that was a, th this picture is all about that bottle of shiso, shiso soda that I brought back from Japan because in Japan, just the way that they do things, everything change, everything is about a style or a trend. And Pepsi, um, decided to make, I think Oreos did this too with watermelon Oreos, but it's a kind of thing where they create a soda for two months and everybody tries to get it and then it goes away and then there's a watermelon Pepsi and a peach Pepsi and whatever, but I, I just could not believe that there was a soda that color. So I, you know, as soon as I started taking the Love Doll pictures, I thought there has to be a green picture based on Shiso Pepsi. And what I really liked about the Love Doll is that because this doll arrived almost naked with no personality, no wardrobe, um, I was sort of inventing things for it as I went along. And I, will, you know, I, I really didn't know what I would shoot until pretty much I tried to wake up and think about what I wanted to shoot that day. And I really had the thought, like, what would it be like if you were seeing candy for the first time? What would that feel like? What would that look like? And um, this one, um, I, I was looking for jewelry and clothes to buy for the Love Doll. And I was on eBay, and I saw an ad for um, 20 pounds of jewelry. And I thought, what, what would that even be? <laughs> and I bid on it. Of course, I was the, probably the only person who bid on 20 pounds of jewelry. But the jewelry arrived, and my assistants and I just spent the day draping the jewelry on the love doll. And then the last touch was that um, I took a lipstick and kind of um, went outside um, the lines of her mouth as though she'd gotten into her mother's, kind of like The Secret Life of the Lonely Doll, if anyone knows that book. She'd gotten into her mother's stuff. When I got a second love doll, um, it, was much more, it was much more difficult to photograph than the first one. And when we unpacked her, I just thought, there's a photograph there, new in, called, you know, it's called new in box. And I, for me, it's one of the most, for me personally, it's one of the most perfect of the pictures. I just feel like it, it sums it all up, like what it was like to get the love doll, to think about the love doll. 
And this is the only picture I took where the two of them were in the same space. It's called The Meeting. And it was actually shot through the course of the day, so um, a number of um, negatives or, uh, or I should say chromes are sandwiched together so that the light, the light moved all around the room and was always bright rather than being in shadow. And um, this picture has a kind of interesting story. Um, my studio assistant that I'd worked with for years told me after we'd shot the Love Doll pictures that she had, uh, she shared with me that she had a tattoo of a, of a geisha on her back. And I saw it and I thought, all this time we've been working with the Love Doll and you never told me. And I said, well, how would you feel if I photographed it? And she was fine about that. And I had um, some, some people come in who have a service where they dress, um, they dress people in New York, they dress you in completely authentic kimono garb, makeup, hair. So these people came in and they dressed my love doll. I mean, there are so many layers of clothing under that vintage uh, kimono, and they dressed, they did the hair and the makeup of my um, studio assistant. So this is the only picture where there's a real person and a love doll together. The, the series that followed uh, I also went to Japan for inspiration. It's called Kigurumi, and I finally got to use real people um, in, a, in a new way, because um, one of the subsets of cosplayers, which stands for costume players, are people that wear masks and walk around in their masked personas. So I found people to model for me, men and women, who really loved the idea of masking, and they began to inhabit these characters. And we ordered clothes. I mean, all of this is like internet culture. You can go really deep into it and find costumes and masks. And the masks were actually made by a cosplayer in Russia. We found them on Etsy, and we would send the money, I don't know, via PayPal. And we really, we didn't know who he was, or if he really was a he, or if the masks would ever arrive. They never arrived when they were supposed to arrive. And it was just like this amazing, um, experiment in trust waiting for the new mask to arrive. And these were shot, I found a very small abandoned house near my studio in Connecticut, where, which is where I make most of my work. And it was like a kind of a cross between a suburban house. It had obviously been inhabited by people. There were little pictures on the wall. It was a cross between a little suburban house and the home of the seven dwarfs. Like the scale was so, <laughs> I felt like this house was a gift to me to shoot in um, because the scale was so appealing, the colors were so odd. I, I felt like it, you know, I couldn't have created a set that I liked more than this. Um, this is a very um, different kind of photo for me because it wasn't in a set and I'd gotten these mermaid costumes and I was about to build sets and have them live in a place, you know, whatever the place is where mermaids should live. I've always wanted to take a picture of mermaids, but my two models were just lounging around the studio and they just looked like these sort of tired, dissolute mermaids. And I just <laughs> snapped the picture. It was very spontaneous. It's not the way I usually work and it, uh, it is one of my favorite pictures from the series. An, a number of this, um, these pictures are already a couple years old, but a number of um, the pictures that I took, I had them taking selfies of them, obviously selfies of themselves, but had them taking selfies. But one of the most interesting things for me was how much my models inhabited their persona, how much they inhabited the character that they were portraying. I tried to keep the same people in the same masks. And for them, I felt like they could express parts of, you know, parts of themselves that they were not comfortable expressing in real life. The way that they posed and the way that they moved was so different from their real life self. And for me, 
The shoots would be pretty long and kind of grueling. We could never get the temperature in the house. It was winter, like above 35 or 40 degrees. Everyone was freezing. Um, when the shoot was over and they removed their masks, I was always really disappointed to, to, to see the human. And I thought, I have to really check that out. <laughs> Think about what that means. Like my involvement in this persona their persona gave me a real window into the whole subculture of masking and what that must feel like you know, for the people that do it. And also for me, it was another big step because whatever these characters are, they exist in this interstitial space between doll and human. And I think if I had had these people available to me when I started doing my work in 1975 or 76, I probably would have just shot those pictures and given up. Because I feel like I've been searching for this, this thing my entire life, this place where human and, and doll kind of you know, meet and coalesce. The, my most recent, uh, my, my newest pictures and the ones that are at the Jewish Museum right now also came from my exploration of um, Japanese culture and cosplay and just my parentheses over involvement with um, being online and exploring um, exploring online communities. And I, I was getting hung up in YouTube videos where girls put on their makeup. And a number of them were demonstrating making big anime eyes on their closed eyelids. This is not something that I made up. This is something that's been done in fashion. And you know, you can make references to so many images in history, to Cocteau, to, to so many different things. But I really love the idea of inviting a makeup artist to paint the eyes, inviting a fashion designer to do the shirts, like inviting these other collaborators in, and then just taking a picture that felt like a school portrait, a very, very simple photo. So these were the first two when I was really focused on the idea of school photo. And then um, I took a break and then I made the ones that, are, that you see now which have a slightly different feel. And they're all models from agencies. Um, that I hired, and most of them already knew my work. And I mean, it's hard to sit there with your eyes closed for two hours to first be made up and then sit there. But two of the young women were artists, and they were excited to work with an artist. The, most of the people that came to me really ha wanted to participate in the project because it's not—it's not. We called it a model nap because you really the models would sit there and basically kind of snooze, but it's not, you know, that the kind of contemplative space isn't, like every model wasn't, that we talked to was not interested in doing that. She's actually a transgender woman who I discovered in a, um, a Bruce Weber shoot for Barney's for the store Barney's New York. There was a beautiful shoot. I think it was called Sisters and Brothers, but it was about tran transgender men and women, boys and girls, and there were beautiful transgender women. And one of the makeup artists I worked with had worked with these um, the transgender women, and he invited them to come and sit. And we just identify them by their names and the color. Like this is called Tatiana Green. And this is called a Jack Violet. Her name is a Jack, A-J-A-K. Um, now the last thing um, that I'm going to show is um, a very short clip. My current project, I'm still making how we see pictures, but I'm actually um, in the process of shooting a feature film, a narrative feature a really a movie movie about a woman artist my age I was gonna say of a certain age my age um, and um, 
My challenge is that I think that Hollywood movies, movies in general, don't portray women my age in a, they don't portray them accurately, number one. And number two, I don't think that artists are ever pr portrayed accurately. In fact, the artists I know, we like to sit around and talk about which movies get it wrong, and they all do. Um, although, I have not seen Mr. Turner yet, and people seem to think that that, you know, I, Roberta Smith of the New York Times, the art critic, kind of like that movie, but we always feel that artists are, maybe everyone in every profession feels that they're misportrayed on screen, but um, so my challenge is to make a movie about a, a group of people my age, about artists, and make it feel real, and also um, portray the making of art in a kind of accurate way. So the artist in my movie, which is called My Art, is the title of the movie, um, goes away for the summer and uses a studio. She, she teaches. She's um, had a kind of a small career. Maybe she had her last show a dozen years before. And she goes to make work at the home of um, a more successful artist friend. And she starts making work alone. And as she meets people, there are two men that work at the house. Um, they work on um, grooming the estate um, where she's staying. And they're out of work actors. And she meets another man who's a trial lawyer. And she meets all of these people and invites them to be part of her work. She's kind of um, bringing them in getting friendly with them, but really using them in a way to make her work. So this is one of her artworks. And what she actually does is shot for shot um, um, recreations of her favorite films. And they're accurate. She tries to make them accurate um, down to every detail. So this is what's coming up. three droogs, that is Pete, Georgie and Dim. And we sat in the Corova milk bar trying to make up our Razoo dogs what to do with the evening. The Corova milk bar sold Milk Plus, Milk Plus Velocet or Synthonesk or Drencrum, which is what we were drinking. This would sharpen you up and make you ready for a bit of the old ultraviolence. So, of course, that's the opening scene, the opening sequence of Clockwork Orange, which is considered one of the best opening sequences, you know, of all time. And another one that we did was the, the last scene of Sub Like It Hot, which is considered one of the best endings of, of all, you know, of any movie of all time. So, the, the movie, the, the clips that the artist um, chooses to recreate connect to the plot of the movie. I mean. I wish I could show you that movie in the summer, but sadly, sadly it won't be done. But um, that was Malcolm McDowell's voice, obviously, and it was it was the exact same length of time, and it was as close as close as you could get. And of course, it's completely ridiculous as well. And I think that's the fine line, you know, that the what I'm kind of working with with this narrative. Um, but anyway, that's I kind of I feel like I did a kind of speed dating thing, you know, through this, but um, I, I would love to take questions. And... Mm -hmm. She did. She said that you guys ask amazing questions. <laughs> yeah. Do you use hot lights or strobe? 
Uh, it depends. I use as much natural light as I can, but with the, um, with the last pictures, if that's what you're asking about, the how we see pictures, I use strobes. All right, I've, ever since you, you showed the, the hot tomato photograph, I, I've been wondering, you know, in this time where it seems everybody wears their wounded sensibilities on their Twitter sleeve, <laughs> um, I, I really wonder what was wrong with that? What, what was wrong if you looked at that and said uh, two different ways of uh, trivializing women, showing a naked torso from behind and, and, and equating it metaphorically with an unbelievably attractive, super ripe tomato? What would have been wrong with that? Who could have criticized your feminist street cred for that? I think, I think that's a great question. And I think back when I made it, People were very harsh. I mean, it's hard to imagine a time when a, a pre-Twitter time when you know we 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 live in in um, the the level of judgmental world that we live in now is so astounding. It's so it, it could. I fear that it's crippling for some young artists and writers to have to deal with it. But I feel like back in the day when I made the photo. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, to answer your question, to, to showing both sides of the story, this you know, voluptuous tomato and then maybe almost a critique at the same time of this, the idea of objectifying women. But I think that when I made the photo, that people were very, very um, stern about their beliefs and I was really afraid of what would be written, particularly by feminist writers. I was a, I was a chicken. I just thought, I, and you know, you make so many things and you think, oh, uh-oh, I can't go there, and oh, I can't go there. And I think one of the really great things about aging as an artist is that it's, you really do become more fearless. Otherwise, I would not be making a narrative feature and have my face be that big on the screen. But um, you really, you just reach a point where you think, what do I have to lose? It's much worse not to tr try something than to try something, but I think back then, um, when I was kind of finding my way, I was, you know, I was much more rigid and rigorous. You know, apropos of that, is that movie Turner? Mm -hmm. you, you know, the liberation of getting old. Right. It's hard to convince young people that it might be liberating, but. <laughs> yes. Oh. <clears throat> That apropos of that, it seems to me that a good deal of your work kind of evolves around childlike experiences placed in a kind of pop contemporary setting. And I, I kind of wonder whether you've ever given thought to embracing some some kind of more explicitly uh, child-centric perspective on something as, as a kind of detour uh, from the kind of hip work that you've been doing thus far. What would that be, that detour? Well, I, I don't know. It's, it's in, uh, I could be quite wrong. But I'm looking for ideas at once. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I could be quite wrong about this. Um, and you can correct me, but it seems to me that there's a kind of romantic element to a lot of what we've seen so far, particularly the work with the dolls. Okay, and I, I just wondered whether you were ever tempted to kind of revisit it from a more child-oriented perspective as opposed to the kind of quasi-ironic detachment of a hip contemporary artist. I don't think I, I mean, I, I, that, that's, a, that's something that I would have to say. I've never felt a hip ironic detachment from my work, ever. And I feel like it was interesting to be part of the pictures generation and have people make those assumptions, because I've always had a really deep emotional involvement in what I make. And it's been embarrassing. 
um, you know, when the first dollhouse pictures were written about as a, as a critique, like a feminist critique of women living in the home or what that would be or that type of bondage, I thought that's very curious. That is not where, that's not where I live. Like I have a, a very um, kind of focused, I don't want to use the word pure because that sounds so pr pretentious, but I see these things in a very earnest way. And probably being called hip and ironic is worse for me than being called funny. <laughs> you know, it's just like, it's so not where I feel like I operate. But I think it's a really interesting, you know, brings up a really, um, brings up a really interesting conversation for me, a level of conversation. Yes. Uh, I'm interested in the progression of your work because you see the early stuff and you even talked about with the dummies that you were trying to connect a feeling and a lifelike emotion with an inanimate object and we see how we see now and you're almost removing that by blinding the object and we don't have that eye contact that we're so used to. Is that a natural progression that you had found in your work or was that a purposeful progression? I think that uh, for me shooting a, shooting a human or working with a human character or any picture, there has to be some sort of interruption. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, in a sense, in addressing your question again, I feel like my subject has been the same since my first photos as, as it is now. Like, talk about a dog with a bone. It's like I, I try to digress, and it's always, you know, and I've, I've taught for many years intermittently, and I always tell my students the most important thing is to find your subject and find your voice. And I feel like perhaps I, I'm either a good or bad example of that because I never deviate from this one subject of women, interiors, interior life. Um, so I, I do, I think that's a really great take on the how we see pictures, but I also felt like I, that that would be the kind of interruption that would allow me to, to maybe shoot a human model, to just make artifice across the most important you know, the eyes are the window to the soul. There are so many, there are so many sort of cliches and metaphors and song titles that have to do with eyes. You could just, you know, keep writing for days. But they are primarily the window into the soul. Yes. Are you exclusively film now, or are you starting to get into digital as well? I use digital um, because the, the, you know, one of the things also about giving a lecture is that the object hood of the work, that's why I'm so happy there's something hanging up upstairs. The How We See pictures are very large and beautifully printed in a way that can o could only be done now with new digital technology. And my printer, who is brilliant, told me that he could get more beautiful prints if I shot digitally than if I shot film. And it was very hard for me to give up film. I have a real romance with it. Number one and number two, the archiving of digital material is just—it's you know—it's something that's going to continue to be a nightmare. And I love all my I have rows and rows of green notebooks that have all of my, you know, I'm very. When Jimmy DeSanta died, the artist that I mentioned, he left his archives in chaos and he left them to me. And it's taken me 20 years to sort them out. So at the same time that I was working with his estate, I decided that I was going to. This was already 20 years ago that I was really going to get my own um, work in order, my archives in order. So I just love notebooks full of you know, negatives and chromes and um, all of the stuff for archiving photographs is just fantastic stuff. And now suddenly we have digital media. You know, you can have just so many backups and drobos and you know, it's just a, it's a, different, it's a different life. I'm doing it, but it's a different life. Um, what was the transition between you having Meryl Street acting as you and you acting as the artist? You mean for the new movie or for my daughter's movie or? For the new movie. <laughs> Although maybe your daughter's movie played a part in that. Well, it's interesting because um, just to digress a little, the, the hardest thing about making this movie was figuring out what the artist's artwork would be. 
And in my daughter's movie, I don't, I don't know how many people have seen it, but I play an artist who takes pictures of tiny furniture in the movie. That's why the movie's called Tiny Furniture. So it's a kind of take on work like mine, but it's not really my work. And for the artwork of the artist in my new movie, I tried to find something that was archetypal because it's, it's a narrative film. I want it to be seen by people out of the art world. And I, I tried to think about who, how people could connect it to art they knew. Because if I, made, if I had the artist make breakthrough, amazing new work, I wouldn't put that work in a movie. I would make it be my own work, <laughs> <laughs> which is really key. To the, whole, um, to the whole way that I arrived at. I, I thought, it has to be work you haven't really seen before, this artist's work. But it has to be something where you could look at and say, Cindy Sherman, or Nikki Lee, or Francesca Woodman, or um, I forget how to pronounce his last name, but beautiful portrait upstairs of Elizabeth Taylor in, how do we say his last name? Mor Maury. Maury, Maury? Yeah. Maury. Maria Mira. Anyway, uh, a Japanese man who, who dresses up in, do you know how to say it, Fab? Do you, Mara. Mara. Okay. Uh, who dresses up in costumes, like in, you know, kind of. Um, um, so, but to get back to your question, my answer to the whole, to the Meryl, to the Meryl Streep question is, my funny answer is, well, when I tried to think who I wanted to play me in the movie, well, to, <laughs> who, would you, who would you want to play you in the movie? <laughs> That's how, but, um, but I really love that, that moment. I'm, I mean, I, I, I didn't show that clip, but there is a moment when the dummy that looks like me actually, the wheel goes around and you can see that she turns into, um, to a real woman, which also, you know, historically, I, I mean, it's in Tales of Hoffman. There's, there are so many operas and movies and stories and fiction where um, a, a doll or a figure or a mannequin become, you know, one touch of Venus where a, an inanimate woman becomes real and becomes the embodiment of kind of classical perfection or beauty. Could you speak to, um, I'm trying to think of how to ask this question so it's not too convoluted, but um, I was telling you that I was really impressed by something you said um, that I read about scale and how important scale was to you in photography, how it in fact might be the reason that you've always loved photography. And I can't help but think about, and, and maybe this is what you meant, but about the psychology of that. I know that in some ways it was about the artifice, being able to tell the lie. But it feels like there's a psychology to it as well. Did you find that in, in your discovery of scale and photography? I did, and I feel like there are so many levels to that. It's such a, a key question, because that kind of miniaturization and that kind of control over a set or over a room as a child, it gives us a great sense of power. As an artist, it gave me a great sense of power. You know, for years, for some years before I started exhibiting, I was working alone, and I felt like I was creating these small operas in a room. And the, you know, first, first you make a scene, but then when you look through the viewfinder, it's almost like looking through, you know, you know, it's like, down the rabbit hole, through the looking glass, all of these magical things into the Easter egg. Um, I went to art school in Philadelphia and the Duchamp, um, yeah, I'm gonna get this, Leitab Donne, I'm gonna get this one wrong again, but this idea of looking through a peephole and being able to see this magical world that you created, that, that was really powerful for me. And you know, I know that it, it's, it, seems, it seems hard to imagine now, but picking up a camera in the 1970s, and a number of women, a number of my colleagues did it at the same time, it was a little bit of a radical move. It's, it seems not that way at all now, but the idea of you know, thinking that a camera could be a tool for art making and not just a tool for photography, and then the magic that, you know, that happened when you look through, you know, just by making parameters around a subject was, Amazing for me. 
Do you think that relates at all to the work beginning small, like the small prints? And I know part of that was just your ability to work um, in your own studio and do it, make them, but and then to life size. Well, I have a really simple explanation for why the scale increased, and that was because I wanted to hang in museum shows where the paintings were and where the big boys were. And that's a really honest, simple answer. Small photographs were going to be ghettoized and marginalized in the photo department of a museum if they got there at all, because people making work who called themselves artists, who didn't call themselves photographers, were having a lot of difficulty being taken seriously at museums in, um, in the 1970s. And I just thought, well, I, I know I'm, I'm so um, invested in contemporary art history, I so much want to have my dialogue be with contemporary art history. And I thought, I have to literally be heard. And being heard meant increasing the scale to the point where there were, you know, most photographers were making really gigantic prints. That's why I was really um, interested. No one knew what the Whitney was going to unveil in, the, in their new building, in their, in their new collection, which artists were in it, et cetera. And they have a number of huge prints of mine. And I was really intrigued to see that what they decided to show were the smaller, the tiny prints, because I feel like that's more in the context of the show, it's a, it's a little more unique, actually, to have a small photo than to have a huge zebrachrome. Another kind of psychology. Yeah, yeah. right, exactly. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. We want to let him dance up. That's <laughs> <laughs>